all right, so we heard this morning from Emmet a Bible verse, actually two Bible verses Emmet read this morning. So who can remember what Bible verses we heard this morning from Emmet? Bible. We, we did mention so many Bible verses, you know, since we are here this morning. So it's easy to forget, I guess. So, but just would like to remind you that uh, Emmet read from Lord's Prayer. And in Luke chapter 11, or Matthew chapter 6, as a part of God's prayer, Jesus taught his disciples and Jesus taught all of us how to pray. And among other things, what he mentioned, he said, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Forgiveness. That's something what I would like to talk about this morning. I would like you to think about, do you know anyone who is struggling to forgive? You don't need to tell me. Just think about it. Maybe you are the person. So, in other words, do we know anyone who is a carrying a grudge in his or her heart? By the way, when I mention a grudge, you all know what a grudge is. So, what would be a definition of a grudge? How we would define a grudge? It's interesting, you know, <laughs> Google knows everything, you know. <laughs> the, the other day, you know, I just put on Google a grudge definition. And, and, and look what I found there. It says, uh, a persistent feeling of ill will or resentment resulting from a past insult or injury. Would you agree that that's pretty much of a definition of grudge? And there is a lot of, lot of definition of, of actually what a grudge is. But you know what I found interesting definition of grudge? And I don't know what would be your thoughts about this or would you agree or disagree, but it's interesting that someone defined the grudge as a cherished dislike. Does it make sense? To me, when, when I first heard this, a cherished dislike doesn't really make a sense. It sounds like, like an oxymoron. You all know what oxymoron is? You know, oxymoron in simple English is words that doesn't really make a sense. <laughs> and, and I learned a lot of oxymorons since I'm, since I'm in this country, to be honest. And, 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 and let's, let's share something, what, what I learned. You know, when I came 10 years ago, that was exactly this month, 10 years since we came in Australia, without English background, without the background of the culture, you know, and it was big shock, you know. But I remember our first door neighbor back in Brisbane, he was, and he still is, funny man. He used to use lots of oxymorons in his talk. And can you imagine someone who, come, who, who came from different culture without even knowing English and hearing his oxymorons? For example, I remember, by the way, it took us a while until we built relationship, you know, even though he was our next door neighbor. I remember he wouldn't even speak to us for a, a month. But we found out why. <laughs> so I don't know how many of you are aware that my wife, Maria, who is not here this morning because she's sick, <laughs> she's scared from animals. And especially 
she's scared from little Queensland creatures, what we call geckos. And I remember when we came to this country, she was terrified by geckos. And if she knew that there is a one gecko in a house, she wouldn't go to sleep. And I tried, you know, my best sometimes, you know, just to get rid of geckos, but I realized, you know, that they're coming again and again. So when Maria would say, oh, there is a gecko, I would just sometimes ignore and go to sleep, you know. Because you, you could never get rid of them, you know. And they are nice, by the way. But from time to time, Maria, when she would see a gecko in the house, she would scream, ah! So can you imagine what our neighbors would thought about what's happening in the house? I was never ta taught about that, by the way, you know. I never said to Maria, stop, you know, because, you know, I was never thinking, you know, about that. But I noticed that my neighbor, he would actually avoid me. Until one day I found out why. Actually, when Maria's parents came to visit us, and, and when, when uh, he saw, you know, our relationship, and, you know, and uh, when he get time, you know, to observe from his house and to look at our windows, you know, so probably he realized, you know, that... I am not violent man, you know. <laughs> and then he revealed his thoughts. And since then, we became actually good friends. He loved our children, Nick and Danny. And our children, Nick and Danny, they were, as they are now, you know, really alive, you know, and, and sometimes wanted to do, you know, crazy things and to jump on and to climb the trees, big trees, you know, and uh, that's fine. But neighbor would come often and he would try, you know, to tell them not to do these things. But he would say in such a manner, it, even though it was nice, but I would think for a while what actually he said to them. For example, hey boys, if you break your legs, don't come running to me after. <laughs> so that was, this was period when I, when I was learning, you know. So hey, hang on. I understood every word what he said. But how someone who broke a leg can come running? That's oxymoron. Or the other saying what he used to say to, to, say to them, hey, if you poke your eyes, don't come seeing me. That's the same thing. We, we all know what, what does it mean, you know? But sometimes it really doesn't make a sense if you don't know background. So, I'm not off the topic, by the way. A grudge, a cherish dislike. How someone may cherish something what he or she doesn't like. Another oxymoron is, I'll tell you an open secret. Can be secret open? All right. People who are carrying a grudge I li are like a time bomb. They may explode any time. Do you know such people? What, what is the reason for that? And I would say the reason is really simple unforgiveness or being unable or unwilling to forgive. This morning I would like to talk about a man and I will mention his name just now and trying to see how many of you will know who is the person. So if I say to you Ahitophel does it ring any bell? Ahitophel. Kona says yes. So who was Ahitophel? 
So who was Ahitophel? All right. If we wanted to find out who was Ahitophel, let's open first book of Chronicles. First Chronicles, chapter 27. So first book of Chronicles, chapter 27, and verse 33. So we're going to find out who was man whose name was Ahitophel. So maybe my pronunciation is not right, but you will find out soon. So chapter 27, first Chronicles, and verse 33. So my Bible says, Ahitophel was the king's what? Counselor. And I would like you just to keep in your mind another person who is mentioned here. And Hushai, the Archite, was the king's companion. So now we know who was Ahitophel. So the Bible tells us that Ahitophel was the king's counselor. By the way, who was the king at this time? It was David, King David. So Ahitophel was King David's counselor. And when I say counselor, you all know what the counselor is. So who go, usually go to see a counselor? Tell me. Somebody who is in need, you know? Somebody who expects a good advice. Somebody who, who would like, you know, to listen. So it seems that Ahitophel was the man that David loved to listen and to go to see and to ask his advice. But you know what? Another thing what I would like, Ahitophel wasn't just an ordinary counselor. You wouldn't be surprised, or you would, if I ask you to open now 2 Samuel chapter 16. We, we're going to see this counselor. Was he just ordinary counselor or something special? Second book of Samuel, and there we're going to spend a lot of time this morning uh, studying second book of Samuel. And we're going to read in uh, chapter 16. Verse 23. So we know now that Ahitophel was a counselor, but look what sort of counselor he was. Second book of Samuel, chapter 16, verse 23. In my Bible says, Now the advice of Ahitophel, which he gave in those days, was as if one had inquired at the oracle of God, so was all the advice of Ahitophel, both with David and with Absalom. Do we have a clue now what sort of a counselor Ahitophel was? It's, it's pretty much shocking for me. It seems that Ahitophel was like God. There is no mistake, you know. Whatever he said back at those times was right advice. So that's how they saw this man. And now we're talking about forgiveness. Before we see actually that unforgiveness was Ahitophel's problem, I just would like to give you a little bit background of the man he was giving advice to, the King David. So we see in second book of Samuel, and we read about David's sin and its consequences. Before I go further, I would just like to tell you that every sin has its consequences. I know that we love to talk about God who is love, and he is. But every sin has its consequences. 
So let's talk a little bit about background of David's sin. You all know that in second book of Samuel chapter 11, we see the story about the king David. And the story tells us at the time when kings goes to war with their army, at this time of the year, David, instead to be with his army, he was idle at his house. And what he did, the Bible tells us, he went to the, of the roof of his house, and then he saw Bathsheba. Bathsheba, she was a batting day. And then the Bible tells us that David sent people to bring Bathsheba to his palace. And the Bible tells us also that David committed adultery with the woman who was married. And then when Bathsheba went back home, after some time, the Bible tells us that she sent a message to David telling him, I'm with a child. In other words, I'm pregnant. What to do now? And you see, when we sin, we're trying to cover our sins. But when we cover our sins, it becomes worse and worse. So when David heard the news, bad news for him, he was trying to cover his sin. So what he did, the Bible tells us, because Bathsheba's husband was in war, he sent a letter to his uh, army man Joab, and he, sent, he said, send him back. I wanted to see him. And Uriah came back. He saw the king, and kings asked him about how is the battle going, etc. And now he gave him free time, hoping that Uriah will go back to see his wife. But Uriah said, no, it's not good, because all my people now are battling, you know, they are in war, that I go back to see my wife. And instead to go to see his wife, the Bible tells us that he was sleeping in front of king's palace. So this plan didn't work. So David tried another way to cover his sin. So what he did, he invited Uriah and he made a big feast in front of him, you know? And he tried to make him drunk, hoping that he will go back and he will sleep with his wife. You know the story? You know what the plan was? He was trying actually to cover his sin. And when it didn't work, David sent a letter to Job, his army man. And he said to him, put him in a front that he may die. That was a bit cruel, wasn't it? That was a really terrible thing. But that was what David had done. One sin led to another one. And that's a terrible thing. But there is, as I said, consequences. And you know the story, what comes after that? That God sent the prophet. By the way, what was the name of the prophet? Nathan. God sent the prophet Nathan. And through the story, you know, he said, oh, there was a rich man, you know, and there was a poor man. Rich man had a big, you know, um, possessions, everything. But the poor one, he had only one little lamb or sheep. And the rich man stole this from him. When David heard that, he was in rage. He should be killed. And then the prophet said to him, you are the one. You are the one. So what was the consequences for David's sin? When we read 2 Samuel chapter 12, from verse 10 onwards. Prophet said to him, Adversity will come from your own house. You did what you did secretly, but 
I will do it publicly to you. And terrible things happen. By the way, what's happened to David as a consequence of his sin? First thing, the child that was product of adultery, what's happened with that child? The child died. Then we see another problem. One of David's sons, and his name was Amnon, he looked at his half-sister Tamar. And what's happened? The Bible tells us that he did terrible thing. He lay down with his sister. And that caused another problem. Tamar was sister as well to Absalom. When Absalom heard that his half-brother, Amnon, did this terrible thing, since then, he just was thinking about one thing, how to kill his brother. And he did it. But when he finished that, he was planning another thing, how to take the kingdom from his father. And the Bible actually tells us when we read in 2 Samuel what Absalom did in order to take it over. The Bible tells us in chapter 15, when people were coming to see the king, Absalom would stop them. And they would immediately, knowing that he was a king's son, they would try to kneel down, you know, in front of him. But Absalom would say, no, 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 do, don't do this. Let me give you a hug. And when we read chapter 15, it says in verse 6, in this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the kings for judgment. And, and what I really, <laughs> it's, Important to notice here in last part of this verse. So Absalom, what says in your Bible? Stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So that sounds like a plan, eh? He was bringing people slowly on his side. And he was organizing rebel against his own father. And then when he did preparation, the Bible tells us that he invited a lot of people to join him. And among people who joined him was a man whose name was Ahitophel. So before we go further, just have a think. Who was Ahitophel? The Bible tells us that he was David's counselor, king's counselor. He was very well respected. He had a big wage, I guess, you know. He enjoyed all privileges in, in David's kingdom. So why would such person join king's enemy? Obviously, something was in his heart what he was carrying around. Ahitophel, he was holding a grudge in his heart. So the question is, what his grudge was about? In order to understand Ahitophel's feelings, let's try to put two verses together. Okay, first verse, what I would like to refer you is, 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 34. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 34. And in chapter 33, where you are trying to find, we see the list of David's soldiers, of his mighty men, of those who stands beside David, you know, and went in war on David's side. And in verse 34... The Bible says, 
Elif Helet, the son of Ashbai, the son of uh, the Mach, I don't know, Machhatite. And this is the important next part. Elian, the son of Ahitophel the Gilonite. So now tell me, what we know now, what we didn't know before. Look at the second Samuel chapter 24, verse 34. What we know now about Ahitophel, what we didn't know so far. Ah, it seems that Ahitophel had a son. And his son's name was what? <coughs> Eliam. So keep this in mind. So why are we reading this? Just to remind you, we're trying to find out what was Ahitophel's problem. So now we see that Ahitophel had a son, and his name was Eli. And to understand even better now, let's move back to chapter 11. So, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. So, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. And verse 3 says, So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba? the daughter of Elaim, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So tell me now what we know about Ahitophel. We learn two things. First thing, that he had a son. And his son's name was Elaim. And then we learn that Elaim was, had a daughter. And his daughter's name was what? Bathsheba. So now we know that Ahitophel was what? Bathsheba's grandfather. And these terrible things, what's happened, probably affected so much Ahitophel that he was not able to forgive David for the terrible thing he had done. He was holding a grudge. But you know what? The good news is God teaches us to forgive. And God forgave David. How we know that God forgave David? Straight after prophet Nathan came, if we go back to chapter uh, 12, 2 Samuel chapter 12, when, when prophet Nathan told to David what's going to happen, in verse 13 of chapter 12 says, So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. God forgave David. And the good news is, whatever we do, if we genuinely repent, God will forgive us. Would you agree with that? Amen. But there is still some consequences. Especially if we've done wrong things to other people. God forgave David even though he had to suffer. 
I believe that Bathsheba forgave David because we know the story that after her husband was killed, after some time, she became David's wife. And she gave birth to another man and whose name was, by the way, Solomon. And we know that Eli, Bathsheba's father, forgave David for what he'd done. How we know this? Because we found him now that he is one of the mightiest men of David. Everyone forgave David. And David repents sincerely. Everyone except Ahitophel. So, because of what was in his heart, he was planning how the, to kill the king. And when Absalom organized that rebel, he was among first to join Absalom. And in 2 Samuel chapter 16, we see the advice, actually, that he gave to Absalom. You see, when attack on David was organized, some people were still confused, you know? Because it seems that it's father-son's business, you know? And people be, were a bit reluctant, you know? Should they battle against the king or, you know? And Ahitophel, he knew that. And when we read the oh, last verses in chapter 16, Ahitophel gave an advice to Absalom. And he said following, you know what? I want you to strengthen the, you know, the people who are on your side. And you will do these things best if you do following. And then he said, on the hill, you put a tent there. And sleep with all of your father's wife. And that was the worst thing, actually, what they could do back at those times. And Ahitophel, and Absalom, he accepted that advice. And he did that terrible thing. And when all people saw what he'd done, they were ready to battle. They were ready to war. Because of Ahitophel's advice. And as a matter of fact, when David heard that his son is now going against him. You know what was the scariest part for him? The scariest part was when he heard that Abs uh, Ahitophel is on Absalom's side. Why he would worry about that? Because of his good advices. And if we read chapter 16 in 2 Samuel, when someone told David in verse 31 that Ahitophel is among the conspirators, David did a prayer in verse 30, 31. What, what, what he prayed? He said, Oh Lord, I pray, turn the counsel of Ahitophel into foolishness. Because if his counsel works, it's not good for me. And then we will see how actually God uh, heard David's prayer. In chapter 17, 2 Samuel chapter 17, we hear now another plan what Ahitophel had because of his grudge. And I'm reading chapter 17 from verse 1 to 4. Moreover, Ahitophel said to Absalom, Now let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he is weary and weak and make him afraid. And all the people who are with him will flee. And I will strike only the king. Then I will bring back all the people to you. When all return, except the men whom you seek, all the people will be at peace. And verse 4 says, And the saying pleased. 
Absalom and all the elders of Israel. He had a plan how to ki kill the king. How to fulfill what was in his heart. But God had another plan. You remember, if you're still with me, at the beginning of this sermon, when we were trying to find out who Ahitophel was, the Bible tells us that Ahitophel was David's counselor. But there was another man who was mentioned in that verse. And his name was Hushai. Who was Hushai? Who was he? Hushai, the Bible says, was king's friend. And he joined Absalom as well. But he joined only because David sent him there. In order to be able to hear what Absalom's plans were. So Ahitophel said his saying. And verse 5 in chapter 17 says, Then Absalom said, now call Hushai the Archite also, and let us hear what he says to you. And what, what actually the other man says. When Hushai came, verse 6, to Absalom, Absalom spoke to him, saying, Ahitophel has spoken in this manner. Shall we do as he says? If not, speak up. And, and, and listen now, verse 7. So Hushai said to Absalom, the advice that Ahitophel has given is not good at this time. In other words, he's a good counselor. He's giving good advice. But I'm afraid that this time is not going to work. And then he gave another advice which would actually save David's life. But what is the point of this story? Because of Ahitophel's unwillingness to forgive and a grudge what he was holding in his heart for a while. In chapter 17, verse 23, the Bible tells us following. Now, when Ahitophel saw that his advice was not followed. He saddled a donkey and arose and went to his house to his city. Then he put his household in order. And what he did? And he hanged himself and died. Why he did this? Because of a grudge in his heart. I'd just like to remind you, at the beginning, we said that a grudge is a persist persistent feeling of ill will or resentment resulting from a past insult or injury. And my question this morning is, is anyone among us holding a grudge in our hearts? You see, to hold a grudge or to be upset usually comes because of unjust things what have been done to us. And legally, we have a right to hold a grudge. But holding a grudge it doesn't need to do anything to a person that we upset on. It actually damages ourselves. You see, Jesus, he had all reason to hold a grudge. But when he was on the cross, remember what Jesus said. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Stephen, he had all reason to hold a grudge. But Stephen said, Father, don't count them this 
as sin. What actually Bible teaching us to do when we're struggling to forgive? I just would like to refer you now to book of Leviticus chapter 19. Book of Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 says, You shall not take what? Vengeance, nor bear any what? Grudge against the children of your people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And I really love the last part of this word, this verse, which says, I am the Lord. What does it mean, I am the Lord? That means that God is a judge. He has always last say. Don't take justice in your hands because it's not going to be good for you. I am the Lord, the Bible says. And last verse, verse is what I would like to read before we finish, is in Romans chapter 12. How we should, what approach we should take towards someone who offended us, who said something to us, or who even did something to us. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, from verse 17, Repay not one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peacefully with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, and we just read what is written, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, said the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals on, of fire on his head. And verse 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. My brothers and sisters, I don't know what is in our hearts. Only God knows. But if something, something bothers you, let it go. Leave it to the Lord. He is the judge. And then you will have a peace what God has promised in his word. Amen.